How are we today? Good. Are you glad to be in God's house? Yes. I said, are you glad to be in God's house this morning? Yes. I don't know about you, but this is the best place to be on a Sunday morning. Amen. Amen. I want to give you a really, really warm welcome today. You know, God is here. He wants to speak to you. He wants to encourage you. He wants to provoke you. He wants to challenge you. He wants to move you forward. So I just want to share in the joy of just being here with you today. And it's an absolute joy to be connecting with you in the room and also in the overflow downstairs. If you're downstairs, you are so uh, welcome here as well. God is working here. God is working there. And then also for everyone joining in online, God wants to connect and meet with you in this moment too. It is so great to be connecting with you in this moment. Give God some praise today. Come on. As Pastor Barry said, we are about to embark on a brand new teaching series today where we've just concluded a really great teaching series last week called When You Speak. Say to your neighbor and say, when you speak. When you speak. Anyone blessed by that teaching? Yeah, I don't know about you. It was challenging. I found myself watching every word that was coming out of my mouth. And uh, it was many occasions I would catch myself and my wife would, Regularly catch me as well, <laughs> yeah, and uh, keep us in check. But uh, what a wonderful teaching series. You know, I want to encourage you, if you didn't get hold of that, or maybe you did and you want to get it again, everything is available online. Get onto it, get into it, hear it, uh, let it just saturate yourself and encourage you as you go forward. Uh, but today we're beginning a new teaching series called When You Witness. And this is building towards the, uh, the Billy Graham event that's coming up in just a few weeks' time, 22nd of June, Saturday night, 7 p.m. at the Ovo Hydro. And this is an amazing opportunity we have as a church to bring, to invite, uh, to connect, to see our friends, our family, our work colleagues, our neighbors, uh, connecting in, even for the first time, that beautiful relationship with Jesus. You know, our city will not be the same after it. Our nation will not be the same after. And, uh, you know, this is a really important and significant moment. It's not just a moment to connect in, but, you know, the devil does not want that event going ahead. I don't know if you're aware, maybe you've been around for the last few years, uh, but there was a moment when we were having a conference and scheduled to have a conference at the Usher Hall in Edinburgh. Uh, but because of our beliefs, biblical beliefs, we were kicked out, told you can't come here. At the same time, uh, the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association were traveling up and down the country and finding themselves being kicked out of venues. And they were kicked out of the hydro, said, you are not allowed to come and preach the gospel in this place. Uh, but as you know, if you've been on the journey, we actually went to war, <laughs> if you like, with Edinburgh City Council over this decision. And, uh, and at the same time, so did the Billy Graham Association as well. They went to war with uh, the hydro. And we praise God that we came through victorious. That actually, come on, give God some praise. The outcome of that was that actually Christians are allowed to attend public venues and share their beliefs and share the gospel. And people can and are welcome to come along and hear it. And so this event is actually the event that should have taken place years ago. It is happening in just a few weeks time. But it's an amazing moment to reach and to bring. You know, when I, uh, when I was living in the east end of Glasgow, it was, it was a lovely kind of community around the place. And when I moved there, I was getting to know my neighbors and I'd be out walking up and down the street and they'd be all tending to their garden, most of them elderly, uh, lovely people. And, but it astonished me in the conversation when they would ask me, what do I do and, and what am I involved in? And I'd share about my church connection and, and the fact that I'm, you know, on staff at church. And it was amazing. How many of them said, you know, Dan, I gave my life to Jesus at a Billy Graham event 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 15 years ago. It was astonishing how many people have responded to the gospel in these moments. And the teaching series that we're looking at today, When You Witness, it's an encouragement for us as a church. It's about moving us into a place of faith for our work colleagues, for our neighbors, for our family and our friends, maybe they've said no a thousand times before, but you know, today is a new day. And as we invite and as we bring, we can see them one into a relationship with Jesus. Amen. So I'm going to pray just now. I'm going to pray for today's message. Open this time up to God. But this is my encouragement for you. As I'm praying just now and asking God just to speak and ignite faith and hope in our hearts, 
And that's what happens when we come to the Word. I want you to just think, God, place that person in my heart. I mean, maybe you already have their name. It's that family member who, you, who you've seen them struggling in this past time, and they're distant from God, and you think, God, I want to see them coming back into a relationship with you. Maybe it's that, that university or work colleague, and you've just noticed in this last couple of weeks, they've just had their head in their hands, and they're just struggling. And you're thinking, if only there was some way I could connect and encourage, and you've been praying for them, but now is the opportunity to bring Maybe it's that friend who's just gone through those tough times. You think, I want to reach. I want to see them come to know Jesus. As I'm praying just now, you ask God, God, who is that person I can bring? Who can I bring? And ask God to impress upon your hearts that name. Father, I want to thank you for the time we have together today. Lord, I want to thank you that when we come into your house and celebrate your name, Jesus, Declare you as Lord of all, King of kings and Lord of lords. We are exalting you above every situation and circumstance. Father, I want to thank you that you are here. Anything and everything is possible in your presence. God, when we come to your word, it changes us. It ignites faith. It inspires hope. It lifts us to a new place and moves us forward. And Father, I pray for every single person in the room today, in the overflow and online as well. God, that you will impress a burden upon our hearts for the lost, for those who don't yet know you. And God, most importantly, if there's somebody here today listening in and they don't know you yet, let this be the moment. Let this be the time when they walk into that living relationship with you, Father. You love them and you've already done everything necessary for them to find your life in all its fullness. We give you this moment in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 You know, we might not all be soul winners. We might think, I'm not a Billy Graham. I can't, I can't share the gospel. I don't know how to do that. I don't have the words. I might not be a soul winner, but you know, we can all be soul bringers. And this moment that's coming up is an opportunity to bring people, to bring our friends, bring our work colleagues, bring our neighbors, to extend that invitation to them. On your seats, if you feel underneath your bottom, not your neighbors, you'll find this card, I am Andrew. Now, I was going to title the message, I am Andrew today, but I thought that would be really confusing for any latecomers coming in when they see me up here, you know, declaring I'm Andrew. Andrew's my dad. I'm Dan. And, uh, but I am Andrew. This is all about, uh, this is an encouragement for us and how we can bring people to the event on the 22nd of June. And some really simple steps in here. Pray, bring, share, follow up. But you know, at the space of, at the bottom of this card, there's a place for us to, to put a name. And as we're talking today, and as I'm sharing today, I want you to keep pressing into God. Who is that person? Who can I be praying for? Who is it that I can invite? Who is it I can bring? And the reason why it's called I am Andrew is because it's looking at the disciple of Jesus, Andrew. It's not about my dad, although it could well be. He loves bringing people to Jesus. But it's looking at the disciple, one of Jesus's first disciples, Andrew, and how he brought people consistently to him. Who is Andrew? Andrew is, as I said, one of the first disciples Jesus called during his earthly ministry. And you find that moment in first, the first chapter of John's gospel. It's a moment where Andrew first learns and hears about Jesus Christ. And then immediately following this, he runs and he finds his brother, Simon Peter, and takes him to meet the Son of God. That was his first response. We're going to look at that today. But you know, we can do the same. We can be intentional in our bringing. We can be intentional in our praying. We can stir some hope up afresh. Maybe the person that's on your heart just now, you're thinking, I, I don't know about them. I've asked them. I've shared with them what I believe and they've dismissed it. I want to encourage you, stir your heart afresh. Let God ignite new faith for them. I want to read three stories of Andrew bringing people to Jesus. He did this on a regular basis in Scripture. And I want to look at three accounts of when he did this. The first account is in John chapter 1, and we can read along on the screen together, or we can, you can follow me as I read it. And it's verses 35 to 42. This is what it says. 
It says, the next day, John, this is John the Baptist, was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. And when the two disciples heard him saying this, they followed Jesus. Turn around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what is it you want? And they said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. And so they went and saw where he was staying. And they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. And Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who had heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. And the first thing Andrew did, said the first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah. That is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John, and you will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. Do you know, this was a defining moment in these young men's lives. There was something that triggered in the heart of Andrew in this, at this point. There was a hope being realized a question being answered. They had been raised in the Jewish community and for centuries they had waited for what the prophets had foretold hundreds of years before them that one day God is going to send a Messiah, a Savior to redeem mankind. And they had been looking and longing and searching and hoping. And then this moment arrives. John says, look, this is the answer you've been looking for. This is Jesus, the one who has come to save the world. And Andrew doesn't hesitate. I need to get somebody here. I need to get somebody else into this. I need to bring my brother. I need to bring somebody on this journey with me. The second account I want to read is a story that I'm sure we're all familiar with. It's the feeding of the 5,000, a great miracle that took place. And it's in John chapter 6, verses 1 to 12. This is, this is what it says. Some time after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee. That is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him there because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. And then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples and the Jewish Passover festival was near. And when Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming towards him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for all these people to eat? And he asked this only to test him for he already had in mind what he was gonna do. Philip answered him and said, it would take more than a half a year's wage to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. But another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Say, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? And Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place. And they sat down, about 5,000 men were there. And Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. And he did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So in this moment of need, Andrew was looking. His eyes were open. Philip, just baffled by the challenge. What are we gonna do here? The need is too great. I mean, look at all these hungry people. But Andrew was watching and looking. I love the way how our friend Ray Bevan tells this story. He shares it along this lines. He said, yeah, one day Jesus was out teaching as he often did and his disciples were following him. The multitudes had gathered. It was a long day, a long conference, full on teaching, seminar after seminar, message after message. And the disciples looking at the crowd started to grow a bit sympathetic and said, Jesus, look at these people. They're hungry. I mean, they've been walking and journeying with us all day long. They're, they're hungry. They're tired. Look at, look at these little children. They're starving, Jesus. Send them into the villages. They need food. Let's take pity on them. We've got to do something for this crowd. And then Jesus turns to his disciples and says, you feed them. 
And they turn to Jesus and say, it's okay, Lord. We've had another look. They don't look that bad. (laughs) The people were hungry. Do you know, people are hungry. This world is hungry. It is searching. It is longing. It is trying to find truth and answers. People are hungry. And the people around about you are, are, are hungry. Your work colleagues, who you work with every single day in the office, they are wondering, there's got to be more to life than this. Your neighbors down the street who are facing challenges and difficult circumstances are calling and crying out for a savior. Your family members who you've written off and thought, do you know, I've I've shared with them, I've invited them to moments and they've said no and they're just not interested and look at the way they live their lives and they're, they're not interested in God. At night they are thinking, I wonder, I wonder if there is a God. People are hungry. But you know, there's also people around about you who want to make a difference. People want to make a difference. They want to feel valued. They want to know that their life is meaning something. And maybe it's only a little thing that they have. But I encourage you, bring them to Jesus and watch what he does with it. Watch what he does with it. Just like that little boy. All he had, five loaves, two fish. But Andrew brought him to Jesus and the multitude was fed. The third account I want to share on just now is this. It's a moment where people were gathering in Jerusalem for the Passover festival. It was a busy time. Moment of real celebration. A lot of joy, a lot of things happening, a lot of hustle and bustle. I mean, there was lots going on. Crowds were gathering, people were coming in, traveling in for this moment. We read about it in John chapter 12, verse 20, and this is what it says. Now, there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They traveled in. And they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. And they said, sir, we want to see Jesus. We want to see Jesus. And Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip, in turn, told Jesus. People were traveling in from all over. But this particular group of Greeks, they wanted to see Jesus because of what they'd heard. See, just before this festival, before this time, Jesus had performed a mighty miracle. Lazarus, a friend of Jesus, had died. He'd been in the tomb three days. Jesus called him back to life, raised him from the dead. And people were looking and watching this. The Lazarus who was dead and whose body was even stinking had been brought back to life and was now walking around the town. And so people said, I want to meet the man who raises the dead. I want to meet the one that brings the dead back to life. I want to meet him. We've just finished the teaching series, When You Speak. One of the parts of that was speak well of God. Church, if you've got a testimony, a praise report, something that God has done for you, speak up about it. People want to hear. Speak up about it. Maybe it's a provision in your workplace. Maybe it's a healing that's taken place. Maybe it's a miracle that's taken place. Share it. People are listening. And every occasion in these three accounts, Andrew's response was the same. Come and see. Come and meet. Let me take you to meet Jesus, have you experienced the life that Jesus offers? Do you know that life? Have you experienced that victory that he's won for you? Have you met him yet? I want to encourage, if you haven't or you're not sure, I'm going to give you an opportunity to meet him today. He's here. He wants to know you. He gave everything so you could know him. And I'm going to give you an opportunity at the end of the message today to respond to that and come into a living relationship with him. But church, if you've experienced that life and you know what I'm talking about and you've met your Savior and Jesus is your Lord, my goodness, let's bring others into that wonderful truth as well. Come on. 
So how can we introduce people to Jesus? Well, Andrew showed us how to do that. One person at a time. One person at a time. Let's bring them to Jesus. You know, we pray for revival. We pray for nations to come to Christ. Our expectation is that thousands, the multitudes will know Jesus. But it always, always, always begins with the one. Begins with a person sat beside you in the office or in the lecture room. It begins with the neighbor next door. It begins with your family member who's been distant. It always begins with the one. Let's look at this story then and draw some things out that will encourage us as we bring people to Jesus. You know, Andrew was never known as a great teacher or preacher. He didn't write any of the letters in the New Testament. He wasn't a scholar. And his name, Andrew, actually means man. <laughs> I mean, that's it in a nutshell, man. You know, there's some names in the Bible. You know, that means God is my judge. God is my savior. God is my strength. Man, there's some names in this room. <laughs> Praise and blessing and glory and faith. <laughs> I love it. His name meant man. <laughs> Simple, to the point. Peter Marshall was a, was, a, was a Scottish preacher who moved to America and started working in the Senate, reaching the politicians there. And he called Andrew the saint of the rank and file. He knew his place and he stood there. He was consistent and faithful. Andrew, if you didn't know, is the patron saint of Scotland. We celebrate him on the 30th of November. And do you know why he's the patron saint of Scotland? It's not because of any miracle he performed or any wonderful message he preached. It's because he brought his brother to Jesus, Peter. That's why he's the patron saint. He's, he's also known as the patron saint of fishermen and fishmongers and, and other working people. It's down to earth. Peter Marshall said this about Andrew. He said, Andrew is not one of the greatest disciples, but he is typical of those men of broad sympathy and sound common sense. Do you know any men like that? Women, don't shake your heads. <laughs> Without whom the success of any great movement cannot be assured. And as such, Andrew is everywhere. He is the man who sits beside you on the bus or drives a streetcar, or waits on you in the store or works at the next desk in your office or sells you your ticket at the railroad station or even carries your bags. Andrew is one of those average men and women who are always taken for granted, but without whom nothing could ever be accomplished. Even in the stories that we've read, Andrew's notoriety, and the way he's always referred is Simon Peter's brother. <laughs> you know, Peter was a disciple and the apostle. On the day of Kent, Pentecost stood up and preached and 3,000 souls added to the church. Peter is the one who denied Jesus and then returned to him victoriously and furiously on fire. Peter is the man who's walking down the street and Jesus uses his, even his shadow to heal the lame. That's Peter, a man of incredible activity. But we need to remember it was Andrew that brought Peter to Jesus. It was Andrew. That's how Peter came to know Jesus. And maybe you think, you know, I, I've dreamt down about being the next, next great evangelist, but I, I, could never, I could never be a Billy Graham. I could never be a Reinhard Bonnke or a Peter Pretorius preaching to the millions, seeing hundreds of thousands of people respond to the gospel. I just, I could never do that. But you know, each of these individuals who have done that over the centuries, all came to Jesus the same way. Someone brought them. Be the one who brings the one. Be the one who brings the one. When Andrew went looking for an answer to the hungry multitude, and he saw that small boy with five loaves and two fish, and he even, I don't, 
I don't know if he was just scrambling around. Jesus, you know, our, our, our rabbi, our teacher, our master, he's just said, you know, we've got to feed these people. I've got to do something. I don't know if he was just desperate. He just grabbed whatever he could. He was a kid with a packed lunch. But who knew that when he brought the little to Jesus, the multitude would be fed? Who knows what will happen when you bring the one? What multitude will be fed as a result? This nation will never be the same. If we look into the, the moment and account of Andrew coming to know Jesus and, and his conversion, it's interesting the way God worked that through. Andrew met Jesus through the witness of his friend, John the Baptist. Andrew followed John through all his quirks and antics. <laughs> John came, he said, to prepare the way for Jesus. God used a respected associate to introduce Andrew to Jesus. Andrew believed John's witness, his testimony, because he was a respected friend. He'd watched John, he traveled with John, he knew John. And so when John turned around and said, look, the Lamb of God, Andrew sat up and took notice. And you know, you have folks around you who have watched you. Maybe they've worked with you. And whether you realize that or not, your life has been a testimony to them. Your consistency, your faithfulness, your attitude in the workplace, the way you just seem to keep going even when things get tough. When you stand up and say, look, that's Jesus, the Lamb of God. I want to encourage you. They're going to pay attention. God used a respected associate. God also used a redemptive analogy to introduce Andrew to Jesus. John called Jesus the Lamb of God. Do you know, this analogy would have spoken to Andrew. It would have meant something. John was referring to the fact that for millennia, people, the Jewish community, God's people had been separated from him desperately trying to find, come back into that living relationship with him. But sin had torn them apart, created the great divide. God had made it clear in his law, there is a perfect standard and everyone has missed it. Every single person. The only one that hasn't, Jesus. Everyone else on the planet missed that perfect standard. And there is a price to pay. For our sin. The word tells us the wages of sin is death. There is a price to be paid. God is a just judge. And so when we sin, he doesn't just ignore it, glance over it and forget about it. A price must be paid. That's what a just judge would do. And in order to atone for the sin as a temporary fix, in the Old Testament, they would bring sacrificial lambs. The sin of the people would be placed onto these spotless, these perfect lambs without blemish. And the priests would sacrifice them and the blood spilt would cover the sin. And so when God looked at the people, he saw the blood rather than the sin and say, okay, the price has been paid for just now. But it was just a plaster on a wound. What John was saying in this moment is there's Jesus. He is the Lamb of God. He is the one who has come to redeem mankind. Not just a temporary fix. He is the one that has come to reverse the curse of mankind. He is the one that's come to deal with sin and death once and for all. And on that cross, as Jesus hung there with his arms wide open and his blood was shed, God said, that is enough. That is enough. And Jesus himself said, it is finished. No more does man have to do this. No more does man have to strive to find, find that bridge, that connection back to God. A loving father has sent a son and given everything to redeem mankind. Jesus paid the ultimate price. That lamb didn't just cover sin. 
It took away the sin of the world once and for all. John was addressing a need in that moment that had been carried in the hearts of those individuals. It was in Andrew's heart. That's why he responded. I want to meet Jesus. I want, I want to follow this guy. He was addressing a need and he was presenting a hope. He is the Messiah, the Redeemer, the one who's come to ransom you back. Do you know the folks around you, I, I get into conversations sometimes with people and they, they have questions in life. And they ask me questions that I just don't have the answers to. Maybe it's struggles they've gone through or challenges they've faced or hurts they're carrying. I don't have the answer. Maybe that's true for you. You've got people around you and you say, I just, I don't have all the answers to all the world's questions. But I want to encourage you today, church, if you've come to know Jesus, you may not have all the answers to all the world's questions, but if you know Jesus, you have the answer to all the world's needs. Jesus Christ is the answer to all the world's needs. Amen? Amen. So God used John in this moment to connect Andrew to Jesus. God used a relational, a relational approach, you know, it's been reported that 80% of the people who come forward at a Billy Graham event, who respond to the gospel to receive Jesus, 80% of those individuals have come because a friend has brought them. 80%. God uses relationships to bring people into a relationship with Jesus. Who is around you? Who can we bring? Who can you bring? Who can you invite? Who can you encourage? After Andrew met Jesus, his first priority, first priority, I need to get my brother. I need to share with him what I have just found. It's the first thing he did. Find, tell, and bring. He was intentional about it. When he was with Jesus and the multitude, the hungry multitude before him, Andrew looked, he was intentional. Who can I bring? Who can I bring to Jesus here? When those Greeks were, were wondering, is there any chance we could connect with Jesus? I mean, he's busy. Every, everyone's trying to scramble around to get to him. But maybe, just maybe we can encounter him. Andrew was intentional. Let's bring them to Jesus. Church, just for a moment, I want you to lift up this card. On the front of it, it says, introduce a friend to Jesus Christ. On the back, pray, bring, share, follow up. Now, at the bottom of the card, there's a space I pledge to pray for. Pledge to pray for. Who's that person to you? I mean, maybe they've come straight into your mind. That's them. Maybe you've been praying for them for a long time. Maybe you've encouraged them to church and you've tried to bring them along and they've said no. I want to encourage you. I learned a while back that a no is not a no. It's just a not yet. When you share the love of Christ with somebody and they say, I'm not interested, they're not saying no. They're saying not yet. Maybe it's time. Who is that person for you? There was a young man that we were reaching. We reached out to in the youth ministry and uh, we'd met him playing football one Thursday night. I won't forget it. We, a group of the, the youth leaders went out to one of the football pitches in one of Glasgow's housing estates, a rough area. We just took a crate of cans with us and a football and we just went looking for youth. Who can we share the love of Jesus with? And we got to know these, these young kids and there was a young, young man there, 14 years old. 
who started to engage and connect in with the youth ministry. But he had lived through hell. He was a good kid. He was not a, some of the kids we reached were wild, but he, he wasn't, he was, a, he was a good kid, but he was so broken. He was so broken. When he was nine or 10, a few years before that, his, his father had died. His dad had died from drug overdose. And so he was at home with his mom and his older brother. He was a few years older than him. And at nine or 10 years old, his mom walked into the living room one day and said, I'm, I'm going out for a couple of hours. I'll be back. She never came home. Abandoned them. Didn't know how to raise them. She couldn't cope. She left. They don't know what happened to her. They waited days for her. Nine years old. Where's she gone? His older brother, in the rough area that they lived in, was about 16 at the time and took it upon himself to raise this kid. Thought, I've got to fend for him. I've got to look after this. is the only family we've got. So he, in an attempt to try and raise money, started dealing drugs just to take care of their needs. They didn't know where to turn. They had no other family. They didn't tell anyone at school about this for years. Didn't really go to school that much, disconnected from it. But this kid at 14 connected in with us and would come along every single week and he would hear about the love of Jesus. And after a year of hearing this, I mean, he knew the story. He knew the gospel. We saw kids respond to the gospel every single week. We'd give an appeal and hands would go up and kids would genuinely come into that relationship with God and beautiful thing to see, but he would never do that. And after a year of encouraging him and speaking to him privately and sharing in a meeting, I sat down with him and I said, look, why don't you come through to that place of, of knowing Jesus? I mean, you know the story. You know what he's done for you. But he was so broken. In that moment, he said to me, Dan, I want to believe. I want to believe. I, re I really, really want to believe that there is a God who loves me. I want to believe that there is a father who is looking out for me. I want to believe that there's a Jesus who has given everything for me. But when my own mum walked out, my own mum walked out, how could anybody love me in that way? And I realized in that moment, there was nothing I could say. There was nothing I could share with him that would convince him of the love of Jesus. So I just said to him, look, you know the story, you know the gospel, I've told you what Jesus has done. I can't say anything else. I tell you what, let me just bring you to him. I'll just bring you to him. Let's just take a moment to pray. And in this place, let's just ask God to meet you. Are you open for that? And he said, if God is real, I want to meet him now. We prayed and he just broke down in tears. The love of God just washed over him. His life was changed and transformed in that moment. Hours went by of him just sobbing and laughing and crying. And, and at the end of it, he said, Dan, God is real. God is real. And I know he loves me. We might not have the words we might not know how to share what God has done for us, but you know, we can bring. That kid came to know Jesus. His older brother came to know Jesus. That entire community of friends came to know Jesus. They were radically changed by the love of God. How do I become an Andrew, a soul bringer? God uses ordinary people in very extraordinary ways. Everyone can minister as Andrew did. That's our motto. One in worship, many in ministry. This is an opportunity for each and every single one of us to bring, to invite, to encourage. A no is not a no, it's just a not yet. If you've asked somebody and they've said, no, I'm not interested, ask again. Bring them to this moment. 
And becoming an Andrew begins in the heart. 1 Peter 3.15, in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always, always, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Church, in this moment, let's be intentional. Let's be prayerful. Let's be mindful and let's be bold in our asking and in our bringing. Let's be expectant. Who knows how this world will change as a result of the person you bring? Amen. 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 Come on, give God some praise. Just hold up that card again. I want to encourage you in this moment. If you've got that person on your heart, that friend, that work colleague, God's just placed that, just drop that name into your being. Do you know, I want to encourage you, take the pen beside you. There's pens around the place. Write that name on the card. This card is for you to carry. Take a moment just to write that name. And I want you to, as you write that name on the card, just imagine in a month's time, them sat with you in this place, beside you. Just imagine for a second that name that you've written, maybe it's a son or a daughter or a cousin. Sitting across from the dining room table and them asking you, what does this mean in the Bible? What does that mean? Just imagine that name on the card. Maybe it's a neighbor or a work colleague. You just taking a moment to put your arm around their shoulder and praying with them. For the challenge that they're facing or the need that they have. Church, stir some faith. Stir some hope. Stir some expectation. God wants to use you to bring just as Andrew did, ran and got his brother. Got that young lad. Got those group of men and women who'd come to see Jesus. Let's do the same. I'm going to pray for those names and I'm going to encourage you to do the same in a moment. But before I do that, I said at the start, I'm going to give an invitation. For anyone in the room, down in the overflow, people connecting online, for you to come into that relationship with Jesus. He gave it all so that you could receive it all. God did everything necessary. It's not about what we can do. It's about us being open to receive everything he has done. And maybe in this room today, online, you're not sure of your walk with God. You've heard of Jesus. That's why you're here. You're intrigued, you're interested. You wanna, you wanna see and meet the person who raises the dead that everyone's talking about, but you don't know him yet. This is your moment. This is your moment. So while our heads are bowed, let's just bow our heads, let's just close our eyes for a second. This is a moment for you. God is reaching. He's reaching to you today. You know he's reaching because of the tug in your heart. You can feel it. Something's pulling, drawing. Your heart's thumping. The Bible describes that as Jesus standing at the door of your heart and knocking. That's what he's doing right now. And the invitation to you is let him in. Let him in. It is the best decision you will ever make. He's knocking. Open that door just now. Say, Jesus, come on in. Come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. I want to know you. Just under your own breath, you welcome him in. Jesus, come into my life. Do you know, I want to pray for you today as well. I want to extend my faith towards yours in this moment. 
And so this is what I'm going to ask. If there's anybody in the room and you're opening up your heart to receive Jesus, so I can pray for you just now, so I know who I'm praying for, just raise your hand quickly. And I'm going to take a moment. Thank you. I see your hand. Just raise your hand. Don't hesitate. If that's you today and you say, I want to receive Jesus, and you're in this room today, you just raise your hand. If you're in the overflow downstairs, you raise your hand. My pastor friends down there are seeing this as well. They'll pray with you. If you're online and you're reaching just now and you're saying, I want to receive Jesus, reach in. Send a message, whatever platform you're on. Just say, that's me. I'm reaching. I'm going to ask for anyone else in the room today as well. If you're in this room and you want to receive Jesus, you just raise your hand right now. Father, I just want to thank you for every single person reaching today. Lord, I thank you that you see them. Jesus, you saw them when you went to the cross. When you hung there. When you gave everything, it was for them. To be redeemed, ransomed, won back into a relationship with the Father. I want to thank you that in this moment, you are performing the same miracle you did 2,000 years ago. You're raising the dead. And so everyone who's responding today, regardless of where they're, where they're at, Lord, you're raising them to new life in you. Let them know that new life. Let them be sure of their relationship with you. Let them be convinced of their walk with you and let them be so attentive and aware of your presence going forward. Father, we praise you for all the people connecting today and connecting into you. We give you all the praise. Church, just hold those cards in your hand again. Father, I pray for every name written down today and for those which are in our hearts. Maybe there's some sat here and they didn't dare write the name because they thought there's just no way. God, we lift these names before you today and we say, give us opportunity to share, to bring, to invite. Lord, I wanna thank you that as we do that, we will see this church and this city and this nation changed and transformed as your gospel is proclaimed and your kingdom advances. God, I pray for those people that are on our hearts today. Let them come to know you. Let them come to know you. In Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Come on, give God some praise. Let's be intentional. Bring, invite, reach out. Thank you, church. Bless you.